Hey guys, welcome to this week's lecture, um, the first lecture in Calculus 2. We are going to talk about 7.2 in the textbook, and this chapter is called, or this section is called Integration by Parts. So the last thing that we learned in Calc 1 was how to do an integration technique called substitution, um, called U substitution in particular. And so we are going to um, do some of that as well as a new method called integration by parts to integrate more complicated uh, looking integrals. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about um, or remind ourselves what the product rule is. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to start by reminding ourselves what the product rule is, and then we are going to derive um, the integration by parts rule based on the product rule. Okay, so remember what our product rule said. When we take the derivative of two functions being multiplied, what we get is the following. We keep the first, which is f, times the derivative of the second function, which is g, plus keep the second function, g, times the derivative of the first function, f. Now, what does that mean in terms of integrals? Well, recall that when we take the integral of something, we're basically looking for what you have to take the derivative of to get that thing, okay? So specifically, in terms of the product rule, if I take, if I integrate, if I try to find the antiderivative of, um, f times g prime plus g times f prime, the result is just f times g. That's just the basic principle of antiderivatives. What do I have to um, take the derivative of to get this? And that is f times g, of course. So what we can do is we can apply some elementary laws of integrals to rearrange this function to make it um, into you know, something that we're going to use later on. And the first thing I can do is I can use the sum rule for integrals. And if you recall from last semester, or last time you took Calc 1, um, the sum rule basically says that if you are integrating um, a sum, so like if you have, so we have a sum here, we have f times g prime plus g times f prime. What the sum rule says is that you can separate those out into two separate integrals, like so. So the sum rule says I can take the first thing and separate it with an, integrant, with an integral, plus then I can take the second thing here and separate it with an integral, okay? So by the sum rule, I can, I, can, um, I can write it like this. This is line two. Um, finally, what I can do is I can isolate this, this first guy right here by subtracting this guy from both sides. Okay, so if I subtract this guy from both sides, I end up getting line 3. Okay, and this is what's known as integration by parts. This what I what I have boxed. And I'm going to write it in a different way in the following way. Okay, so what did we just derive? We just derived this. This was in that orange box. And so what I'm going to do to make this look a little bit cleaner is I'm going to say that I'm going to let a letter u equal the function f of x, and I'm going to say the letter v is equal to the function g of x. Now, if you recall last semester when we looked at um, doing substitution, what happens when I take the derivative of both sides when I apply that um, that derivative operator is that I get du is equal to f prime of x and dv likewise is equal to g prime of x. So if I just sub in everything that I just uh, derived here, if I sub that into my formula, my integration by parts in the purple box, what I end up getting is um, is this rule in the orange box. So this is everything we're going to be using for this section, is this formula right here. And so this is called 
integration by parts formula. So over and over we're going to be using this. Very important. Put a star next to it. So let's take a look at actually, like, how do we use this formula? Well, it's the, the strategy that I use first, okay? Anytime I'm doing a problem where I have to use integration by parts is I want to pick my U function to be a function so that when I take the derivative of it, it gets simpler, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at this first example. We have x times sine of x dx. Now, remember when we found antiderivatives, it was super easy to find antiderivatives of functions such as x squared or maybe x to the fifth, or sorry, let's do that again, x to the fifth. So these were easy, right? It was also easy to find the antiderivatives of simple trig functions like cosine of x, right? We're asking ourselves, you know, what do I have to take the derivative of to get cosine? And of course, the answer here is sine of x. The derivative of sine is cosine. Therefore, the answer to, you know, what is the indefinite integral of cosine? That's sine, right? So these were all pretty easy to do. However, um, and then with the x squared, you just add one to the exponent and divide by that. So the antiderivative of x squared is just x to the third over three. Add one to the exponent and then divide it by whatever you get when you do that, and that's three. Okay, so that was simple. Now, if we have, um, if we have something like this, it's not so simple. Um, and again, you know, if you were to try substitution, that would also be something that wouldn't really work well. If you let u equal sine of x, well, then du is going to be um, cosine of x, and nothing cancels really nicely, okay? So, you know, when you're in that situation, you want to see, can I use integration by parts? That's an integration technique. And so, okay, let's talk about this key strategy, because this is this is, I think, the most important thing. I want to pick a u so that when I take the derivative of it, it gets simpler, okay? Let's say, let's say I just pick, we have two options, really, right? We can either pick x or we can pick sine of x. Now, if I take the derivative of x, does it get simpler? Well, it's actually, is the derivative of x simpler than x? Well, yeah. The derivative of x is just 1, right? So yeah, that is simpler. What about the derivative of sine of x? Well, the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x, which, eh, that's really not simpler. So I'm going to start by saying u is equal to x, okay? Um, that's kind of like the big idea here because... <sighs> What you're trying to do is you're trying to assign a u and assign a dv, okay, based on what we have here. So what could be u, what could be dv? Well, again, if I pick uh, sine of x to be u and I pick x to be v, I mean, that might work out in the end, but it's always, um, it's always going to work out best when your u gets simpler when you take the derivative of it. And that didn't really happen with sine of x. So that's my first step. Let's say that u is equal to x. So we need four kind of things here to use our formula. We need u, we need du, we need v, and we need dv. 
Those are the four things. Now, the key strategy says that we should choose U to be X. Now, is this strategy going to work every time? Mm, probably not, but nine out of 10 times it will. When it doesn't work, you can always, um, you know, pick the other function and see if that works. And if that doesn't work, then you might have to use a different strategy like substitution or maybe um, maybe even a trig substitution. Um, but usually this strategy will work, pick, picking the simpler function in the product that you have. All right, so du, if I take the derivative of both sides, du is just equal to dx, right? One dx because I'm differentiating um, with respect to x on the right side. V, well, we, so what are we looking for? We found U, U was X. I'm going to actually write this up here just so that you guys see this. U was X. So this is U. And the rest of it is equal to DV, right? So sine of X dx is equal to dv because we want the formula to match up with what we have to, you know, in order to use this side of it. Okay, so dv is going to be what's left over, which is sine of x dx. Now to figure out what v is, we have to integrate um, dv, right? Because it's saying, well, the derivative a v is sine of x, so what's the antiderivative? That's going to give us v. So let's go ahead and figure that out. We want to see what is the antiderivative of sine of x. So this is going to give me v, right? And so we're asking ourselves, what do I have to take the derivative to get sine? Well, that's going to be not regular cosine, but negative cosine. If I take the derivative of negative cosine, I get positive sine. So V is just equal to negative cosine X. Let me just turn to my pages here and make sure we're on the right track. Okay, good. So once we have this stuff, then we can use the integration by parts formula that's boxed in orange. So it says that, you know, this guy, u times the integral of u times dv is equal to the right side, which is uv minus the integral of v du. So this, I'm just plugging in, well, u times v is just x times negative cosine of x. Again, I'm just using the right side of this formula. Minus the integral of V times DU, which is just DX. And what I can do with this negative one that's being multiplied is pull it outside of the integral. I can do that with constants, if you remember. So when I pull it out, that double negative becomes a positive here. And finally, I want to take the antiderivative of cosine of x to simplify this. Well, what, do, you know, what is the antiderivative of cosine? That's sine, because when I take the derivative of sine, I get cosine. So this just becomes negative x cosine x plus sine of x. And since this is an indefinite integral, I can't forget my little plus C for the constant here. So that is my answer for that guy. Let's do another example. And I encourage you to pause the video and see if you can try to, you know, the hardest part is identifying the U, the V, the DU, and the DV. That's the hardest part. Once you have that, everything else is, is pretty uh, straightforward. But, um... Okay, so we have two functions. We have a function x. We have a function e to the x. And my question for you is, which of these, when you take the derivative of them, gets simpler? Is it x or is it e to the x? Well, the derivative of x is just 1. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So which one gets simpler? Well, the x does, right? 
So since u is x, when I take the derivative of u on both, you know, I take the derivative of both sides, I get 1 dx, or simply dx, all right? Derivative of x is just 1. Um, all right, so then we have v and we have dv. Now remember, dv is the part in our formula. Since, since we already assigned x to u, that means that the rest that's left over has to be uh, dv. So since x is u, that means that e to the x dx is going to be dv, right? So this is going to be e to the x dx. Now remember, to get v, I have to, this is saying the derivative of v is e to the x dx. So the antiderivative, I need to set up my integral. I need to integrate e to the x dx, and that is going to give me v. Well, this is easy because, remember, e to the x is the derivative of itself. So this is simply e to the x. All right. Okay, awesome. So now that we have everything, we are actually going to use the formula that I boxed and read above. So it says that, you know, when I take the integral of u times dv, what I get on the right side is u times v, so we have x times e to the x, minus, let's take the integral of v, which is e to the x, times du. Well, du is simply dx, and then we evaluate. So we just, we just establish that when we integrate e to the x, it's still e to the x, so this is our answer, and we can't forget our, our plus c. All right, let's do another example. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up my u, my du, my v, and my dv. Now, I have two options for u. I have theta. So could this be u? Or I have cosine of theta. Could this be u? So first thing you want to do is pick out your u. Um, well, and again, you know, I say this isn't, this strategy works 90% of the time um, from my experience. But, you know, um, sometimes you do have to use other formulas uh, to figure out integrals. Integrals, integrating is is way harder than finding derivatives. It's just um, it's just the way it is. I mean, some you know some people uh, some some integrals are unknown still to this day. So, um, but you know we we do what we can and we use the tools that we have at our disposal. So, which of these are going to be you? Which of these, when you take the derivative, does it get simpler, theta or cosine of theta? Well, remember, theta is just a variable, just like x. If different variables confuse you, just use x, okay? This is the same thing as x cosine x. Well, when I take the derivative of theta, or x if you like that, you just get 1. When I take the derivative of cosine theta, I get negative sine theta. So which of those gets simpler? Well, obviously theta, right? So I'm going to say that u is equal to theta. Erase this. Now, du. If I take the der if I you know apply the derivative operator to both sides of u equals theta, what I end up getting is du is equal to d theta, right? Or one d theta, if you like that. Okay. Now, remember the leftover is going to be dv. What's left over is dv. We establish that this guy is u, and so what's left in the formula is dv. What's left is cosine theta d theta. Okay. So now what we need to do is we need to find v by taking the antiderivative of cosine. All right, so v is going to be the antiderivative of dv, right? So what do I have to take the derivative of to get cosine? 
Well, that's going to be sine, right? So V is just equal to, to sine theta. Now that I have everything I need, I can use the right side of this formula here to find my answer. Okay, so what I have is I have u times v, so I have theta times sine theta minus the integral of v times du, which is d theta. Now this part, I'm taking the antiderivative. What do I have to take the derivative of to get sine? We'll have to take the derivative of negative cosine to get sine. So this becomes theta sine theta minus negative cosine theta. And I can just simplify this a little bit, make that a plus, and call it a day. There it is. Ba bam, that is our answer there. Okay, so this is just kind of a recap of what I said. Um, you know, whatever you let dv be, like you need to be able to integrate dv easily to figure out what v is. Sometimes it might require more than one step, but it can't be an impossible task. And then as I said, it helps if the derivative of u is simpler than u, and it helps if v is simpler than the derivative of v. So these are just some some rules that you can uh, you can go by when you're doing these problems. So now we have a definite integral. Recall that a definite integral has upper and lower bounds. You know, so, and remember these bounds um, are, you know, typically with res respect to the x-axis. We are going to be integrating with respect to the y-axis later on, but for now, let's just stick with the x-axis. So this is saying, you know, find the area under ln of x, starting when x equals 2 all the way to x equals 3. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the integration by parts formula to do that. And I'm going to write it over here. So we have u dv is equal to u times v minus v du. So here is my integration by parts formula. And for definite integrals, I mean, basically, we're just plugging in the bounds um, at the end, just like we did before last semester. Uh, you know, we evaluate the upper bound, and then we subtract, you know, whatever we get when we evaluate the lower bound. Okay, so let's go ahead and, um, and figure out what, you know, what u is equal to, what v is equal to, um... I mean, we don't have much of a choice here for u, right? So we have ln of x, right? And so let me write this here. So we have u du v dv. So the first step is to choose u. Now, if I choose u to be ln of x, when I take the derivative of that, is it going to get simpler? Well, yeah. Remember, the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x, and so du is just going to be 1 over x dx, all right? That means, according to my formula, dv is whatever is left over. Well, we said that u was equal to ln of x, so dv has to just be this dx. So this is dv, this is u in our left side of, on the left side of the formula. Okay, so this is dx, um, right, so now we have to find v. So let's go ahead and, uh, and we're integrating dx, or 1 dx, that might be um, a little bit more familiar. And remember what we do when we integrate these constant polynomials, we're just keeping the constant and, um, you know, because what this is essentially is this is 1x to the 0 secretly, right? Now, if I add 1 to the exponent and divide by 1, I just get 1x or just x, okay? That's what I'm trying to say here. So when I take the integral there, I'm just getting x to the first or x. So that's my, um, this is, uh, 
equal to V, remember that? And so this is gonna be X. And now that I have everything, I can simply plug everything into my boxed formula and see what I get here. All right, so let's do that. I have the integral of U times DV, in this case, ln X times DX, is equal to U ln X times V, which is X, minus integrate V times DU, which is one over X DX. All right, now I can simplify these X's out so that I'm just left with the following. As we just said before, the antiderivative of one is x. And that's it. Okay. So this is my, um, my, you know, indefinite integral. But remember, I am evaluating from these bounds two to three. All right. So what I want to do is I want to evaluate this from two to three. And so remember how we did that, wherever we see an x, we put in the upper bound. So this is ln three times three minus three. Um, so that's the top bound. And then we're gonna take away what we get when we plug in the lower bound. So that's two. So ln two times two minus two and when I simplify this, I end up just getting three ln three minus one minus two ln two. And that is my final answer here. I think I'm gonna skip this one. Let's go ahead and look at this next example we have an indefinite integral, x to the six ln of x. So remember our first task, out of the two functions, x to the six and ln of x, which one actually gets simpler when you differentiate? Well, the derivative of x to the six is six x to the fifth, mm, not much simpler. The derivative of ln of x is one over x. That is definitely simpler, I think. I mean, lns are weird, right? <laughs> um, you know, not to be prejudiced against LNs, but they're just, I don't know, they kind of just make you uncomfortable. Like, I, I don't know, but <laughs> I don't know what to say here. However, um, I think it would be a good idea to let you equal LN of X. Okay, so that means that DU, when we take the derivative of both sides, is just one over X DX. Now we need to figure out what is DV. Well, dv is whatever's left. u was ln of x, so dv is going to be this guy and this guy. That's what's left, x to the 6 dx. Okay, um, now v, we have to integrate this guy to find the antiderivative, right? Because when I take the derivative of v, I get x to the 6 dx, so what is that? Well, when I integrate x to the six dx, I add one to the exponent and divide by whatever I get. So that's x to the seven over seven, or just one seventh x to the seventh, if you like that better. Um, okay, I'm gonna write that actually. So there it is. Now let's go ahead and employ our integration by parts formula. So, the right side of this formula says uh, what we end up getting here is u times v. So u is ln of x, v is 1 7th x to the 7. All right, so that's the u times v part, minus integrate v, 1 over 7 x to the 7, times du. Well, du is 1 over x dx. All right, so I'm just plugging everything into my formula that I have boxed, everything on the right side of that formula. Because again, this is the left side of the formula, u, the integral of u times dv, where this is the ln of x is u, and 
x to the 6 is d. Well, actually, x to the 6 um, dx is, is dv. Let me erase this. Okay. All right, so let's see. I'm just going to make this look a little bit nicer. Bring out that 1.7 to the front. And then what I can do here is... I can pull out this 1 over 7 in the front. Remember, I can pull constants out of the integral. And then what I'm left with on the inside, well, x to the 7 times 1 over x, that's going to simplify down to x to the 6. And now I can actually find the antiderivative here. So the antiderivative, I'm going to put this in brackets, is going to be x to the 7 over 7. And so when I multiply that out, when I multiply that out, I just get negative uh, 1 over 49x to the 7th. And let me check my math here. Yeah, that looks good. Oh, did I forget the plus c on the other problem too? I think I did. No, that was, that was a definite. But I did with this problem. Look, see, guys, I always forget the plus C with the indefinites. Um, let's put the plus C to be, to be good. Okay, so that's our answer there. Let's see where we're at on time. Should we do one more? Do, 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 do. Let's see. Uh, no, the next one's pretty long. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and jump off and we'll continue this off um, in the next video. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in just a moment. Okay, so the next problem we're going to do is we're trying to find um, the antiderivative of x squared times sine of 4x dx by using the integration by parts formula boxed in red. So again, what you want to do first is identify what u is in your product and what dv is in your product. And this is our product that we have to work with. So whatever we pick for u, the rest of this is going to be dv, the rest of the product. So remember, we want to pick either, so we want to pick something that when I take the derivative of it, it gets simpler than before. So our choices are sine of x, sine of 4x, I'm sorry, or x squared. Now, which of those, when you take the derivative, gets simpler? Well, the sine of 4x definitely doesn't because we have to use the chain rule and it's just going to get longer, right, than it was before. However, when you take the derivative of x squared, it's just 2x. So that does get simpler. So I'm going to start by saying let u equal x squared. And then the rest is going to be dv. So the rest in this product is the sine of 4x times dx. So dv is going to be so dv is going to be the sine of 4x dx du, if I take the derivative of both sides of u equals x squared and rearrange, I get du is equal to 2x dx. And v, we need to figure out by integrating dv, right? Because we have that the derivative of v is sine of 4x. To get v, we need to find the antiderivative, which means find the integral of. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and integrate dv, which is the sine of 4x dx. Now, you can't immediately see what the integral is of sine of 4x. So we have to employ a previous learned strategy called substitution, in particular u substitution. Now, the u that I'm going to be substituting is not the same u up here, so don't let that confuse you. Just kind of think of it as like two different things. So um, basically what u substitution does is if I can find something and replace it with a u so that I can figure out the antiderivative, then that's what you should do. 
So what we're going to do is here, we're going to use u substitution and let u equal 4x. Therefore, when I take the derivative of both sides and rearrange, I get du is equal to 4dx. dx, remember I want to isolate dx so that I can replace it in the integral. dx is going to be du over 4. Um, and what this becomes, let's put it down here, make some room. So we said 4x was u, and when we solve for dx, we got du over 4, right? We want to replace dx because since we replace the variable x with the variable u, we want to make sure that we're integrating with respect to u and not with respect to x. Okay, so what I can do now is I can pull a 1 fourth out, of the, out in the front. And now this is a much easier problem because, <clears throat> excuse me, I can figure out what the antiderivative of sine of u is, right? What do I have to take the derivative of to get sine? Well, not just cosine, but negative cosine, right? If I take the derivative of negative cosine, I should get sine. So this is going to be a fourth times negative cosine of u. And u, we want to put our original, um, our original variable in at the end once we integrate. So u is equal to 4x. So we get negative a fourth, if I pull that negative out, cosine of 4x. So that is going to be my v here. So let's write that up here. All right, now that I have all of this information, I can just use my formula box in red. So let's go ahead and make some room. Okay, so if I make some room, um, so the left side of this formula, this side, was this part, right? So we said that, um, let's make some room here. We said that x squared was equal to u and the rest was dv. So the sine of 4x times dx is in replacement of the dv. Equals, now what we're going to do is use the right side of this equation equals u, which we found was x squared, times v, which we found to be negative a fourth cosine 4x, minus integrate v, v is again negative a fourth cosine of 4x, times du, du is 2x dx, okay? All right, so what I want to do at this point, I can't really do a whole lot here. You know, I can maybe bring the negative out um, and make it look a little cleaner that way. But what I really want to figure out is this integral, right? This is kind of my, my stumbling block right here. I'm trying to integrate negative a fourth cosine of 4x times 2x dx. And that's not an easy thing to integrate. What I can do to start out with, though, whenever you have a complicated integral or even a non-complicated one, the, the easiest thing to do is to pull out the constants first. Now, 4 cannot be pulled out because it's the argument of a trig function, cosine, right? You can't take out anything that's in that parentheses. But I can pull out this guy and this guy, right? Negative a fourth times two is just negative two fourths, which is negative a half. So that's what I can pull out there. So let's go ahead and do that. So this guy, I'm just going to write as uh, negative a fourth x squared. Cosine of four x. Then if I pull out the negative a half from this and this, 
the double negatives make a positive in the front of that integral. You see this negative here. So this is going to become a positive, a half, and then everything else is kind of inside there. We got cosine of 4x times x dx. So all I did was I, pu I pulled out um, a negative 1 half. Okay. At this point, we're in a similar situation, like trying to integrate this. We can't use substitution, um, and you should prove to yourself why substitution won't work if you say u equals 4x. Substitution is not going to work here. So when you can't use substitution, you want to use integration by parts. So we have to do it again, unfortunately. So it's the same kind of idea as before. What's simpler out of cosine of 4x and, and regular x? What's the simpler thing out of that product? Well, the simpler thing is definitely x when I take the derivative, right? So I'm going to let u equal x, all right? That means that whatever's left over in this product, which is cosine of 4x dx, that's what's left, that's going to be our dv in our integration by parts formula. So let's write that down. Um, now du, when I, when I integrate both sides of this guy, I get that du, maybe I'll do that in yellow too, I get that du is equal to 1 dx or simply dx. V, I have to take the antiderivative of this again. So let's put this off to the side as my scratch work. I'm taking the antiderivative of cosine of 4x dx. So here I can use substitution because I don't have a product of functions. I just have this 4x on the inside that's messing up my antiderivative game. So what I can do here is, again, I can say, you know, let u equal 4x. And again, this u doesn't have anything to do with the u and in the integration by parts formula. It's kind of a separate entity. So if u is equal to 4x, then taking the derivative of both sides, du is equal to 4dx. And finally, isolating dx, we get dx is equal to du divided by 4. When we get, you know, when we divide both sides by 4. Okay? So, since all of this is true, we can replace our integral here. Instead of cosine of 4x, that's the cosine of u. Instead of dx, we have du over 4. And finally, I can pull out that 1 over 4. So I just have cosine of u du. And so you ask yourself at this point, well, what do I have to take the derivative of to get cosine? That's what you're asking yourself when you integrate cosine of u. And the answer is sine, sine of u. So the answer here is a fourth sine of u. And now the last thing to do is just plug in whatever u equal to. Well, u was equal to 4x. So we get a fourth sine of 4x. Okay, and that is our v. Sine of 4x. Okay, so let's see. Let's go ahead and erase this. Okay. All right, so let's carry down everything in black. Right, because we didn't mess with any of that. We had all of this to start out with. And then we need to use integration by parts with all of this stuff to evaluate this integral here. So integration by parts says that this is going to, and I'll do it in purple, Integration by parts says that this whole thing is equal to u times v. So we have 
um, x times v, a fourth sine of 4x, okay? And then minus And then minus the integral of a fourth sine of 4x times du dx. All right, so I see an end in sight here. <laughs> it's, uh, I know it's a lot, but, you know, some of these problems are weird. So we need to figure out what the integral of this is. Now, the, f the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out this constant. That's going to make things easier. So let me just rewrite this and kind of, you know, write it as we go. So we have cosine of 4x. Um, I'm going to distribute this 1 half to that product and over here. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to do... A half times a fourth is going to give me an eighth. So that's an eighth x times sine of 4x. I'm just distributing that one half to these guys. Then I have um, minus, well, a half times a fourth that's coming out here is an eighth. Okay, so I'm just trying to simplify this so it doesn't look as ugly, I guess. All right, so all right, so that's where I'm at so far. Now let's go ahead and um, and do the last part of this problem, which is integrate what I have in orange right here. Now I don't have a product of functions, so I can use substitution, right? I can let u equal 4x. So let u equal 4x, therefore du is equal to 4dx, taking the derivative of both sides and dividing both sides by 4. We get dx is equal to du divided by 4. So rewriting this orange integral, the sine of 4x dx, instead I have the sine of u, and instead of dx, I have du over 4. So I'm going to take out that 1 over 4. And the answer here. So again, when I take the anti the antiderivative of sine, that's going to be negative cosine. So my answer here is negative a fourth cosine of u, which u is 4x. And I think we have the end in sight here. So <laughs> I know this is this is a crazy problem. But OK, so now we need to replace this with our integral. Negative a fourth cosine 4x. Four Let's do that. Let's make some room. If you're really careful, you know, and you are meticulous about your math and you're distributing, you'll be fine with these types of problems. But what these types of problems teach you to do, I think, is to do two things. To think ahead, right? Choosing your U and your V. Um, and it teaches you to stay organized. Because if you don't stay organized, it's super easy to mess up. Now, the orange I'm replacing with what I just found, which was negative a fourth cosine of 4x. And I can't forget the plus C. <laughs> plus C. Okay, so let me rewrite this. And if you mess up with one of these problems, don't feel bad. Um, they are, you know, super, super easy to mess up on. Right, you have to be super meticulous, as I was saying. But that's what it's all about. It's just about, you know, practicing how careful you are. Okay, so this is our final answer. I know this problem was wild, you guys, but... Um, all right, awesome. 
let's see where we're at here. Okay. So we want to find cosine squared theta d theta. We want to find the antiderivative for this. So this is a problem where you might be like, can I use u substitution? And unfortunately, you cannot. Because if you were to say, oh, well, let cosine b, cosine theta be u, and then you do your du and everything, what ends up happening is things don't cancel, right? You're going to end up having a, a weird sign of theta somewhere. So unfortunately, that doesn't work. I do encourage you to, to try and, um, and see why it doesn't work, but it does not work. So we have to use our other method of integration, which is integration by parts. Now there is, if you're watching this and you're taking uh, calculus two with me, you're gonna see a pretty similar problem like this on your homework. It might be sine squared, I think, but um, but it's similar. So, so pay attention, <laughs> I guess. Um, all right. So what I'm gonna do first to attempt to tackle this is I am going to instead of writing cosine squared, I'm gonna write cosine times cosine. It means the same thing. Right, because what I'm trying to do when I use integration by parts is I'm trying to first find a u and a dv. That's what I want to do. Um, okay, so looking at this, we kind of see that we don't have a lot of options here when we're choosing u. We, we just have cosine, right? Cosine times cosine. And so I think the, the easiest thing to do is to just say that u is equal to cosine theta, because we don't really have a choice. All right. Now, when we take the derivative of both sides, the derivative of cosine is a negative sine of theta, d theta. That's our variable here. Maybe I'll write this a little bit better. Let's do du is equal to negative sine theta d theta. Okay, so we chose this to be u. That means the rest of this is going to be dv, according to our formula up here. So dv is, let's write it up here. Maybe I'll just write it up here. dv is cosine theta d theta. So v, you know, we have to, we have to integrate that. So I'm integrating dv. I'm integrating the cosine of theta d theta. That's easy. We don't have to do any substitution or anything. You're basically saying, what do I have to take the derivative of to get cosine? And that's going to be sine. So v is just sine of theta. Thank God. Okay, so far so good. We have these four things that we needed. Now let's use the integration by parts formula boxed in red. So this is going to equal, and again, I'm using the right side of this formula, u, which is cosine theta, times v, which is sine, minus the integral of v times du, times negative sine theta d theta. This problem has a little, um, a little bit of a trick to it. Uh, you kind of like you're gonna end up getting stuck at this point where you have the negative sine squared theta, because then you would ask yourself, well, what do I do with that? I guess I have to do integration by parts again, and you're and you're gonna just end up, you know, going on a loop on a wild goose chase. And sometimes that's gonna happen with these problems. I mean, that's that's part of the process. So. Um, but <laughs> since I already know how to do it, I'm going to show you, you know, um, a good way to go about this. But, but, you know, like I said, if you're on your homework and you, you go on a wild goose chase and you're like, ah, this didn't work, you know, like, what did I do wrong? Like, that's totally normal. Like, that's part of doing these problems. Okay. So what this problem does is it it kind of forces you to use the left side as well. Because remember, we talked about, we talked about this is the left side of the equation and the other side is the right side, okay? 
So what we have right here is the right side of the equation. That equals the left side, which, remember, was what we started with. Cosine squared theta d theta. All right, and you're going to see why I'm just writing the left side there. So I can, you know, clean this up a little bit. Um, I can say this is cosine theta times sine of theta. And there's probably other ways to do this, but, um, you know, just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to do it one way. Uh, but, you know, just to let you know, there's multiple ways to do all of these problems. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out this negative sign right here to the front to make that positive in the front. And that's going to give me sine squared theta d theta. So if you want to, you can try to use integration by parts again. Um, I'll tell you right now, you're going to get stuck. But, um, but the trick is the following. The trick is to look at the left side. Okay. We have a cosine squared theta, the integral of cosine squared theta. Wouldn't it be nice if the right side somehow had an integral of cosine squared theta? If that were the case, we could do a combining like terms kind of trick and, um, and hopefully things will cancel out. So the strategy that I'm going to use right now is I am going to replace sine squared theta with something that makes mathematical sense, something that has a cosine squared in it so that I can hopefully combine like terms. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to use what you learned in trig and it's called a Pythagorean identity. And that identity is this one, cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to one. Okay, you learned that in trig. It's been a while probably, but now what I'm going to do, since I want to replace sine squared, I'm going to isolate it by subtracting cosine squared from both sides. Therefore, sine squared of theta is equal to one minus cosine squared theta. That's what I'm looking for, and that's what I'm substituting in right here. Again, the strategy is to notice that the left side has a cosine squared and to realize I'm stuck and I need to do something to somehow um, combine like terms so that something cancels. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do. So let's go ahead and rewrite this. Okay, so we have cosine theta, sine theta, and instead of the sine squared business, I'm going to write 1 minus cosine squared theta. That's equivalent. D theta. And from here, I'm going to use this property of integrals that, so cosine theta... And theta. So I'm going to use the property of integrals that says when I have a difference of two things that are being integrated, I can just, you know, um, separate them out that way. So what I can do is I can say this is plus one d theta. And then we have um, minus cosine squared d theta. All right, I think we good there. All right, so that is just, again, you know, by the property of integrals, the difference property of integrals. And now I see, a, I see something interesting. On the left side, I see the integral of cosine squared theta d theta. And on the right side, I see the same thing. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I am going to add this to both sides. Forgot the theta in there. Right? Just like as if it were a variable or a number. And this is a pretty weird trick, but it works. 
So it's like combining like terms. I have one of something plus another one of something. How many of that something do I have? I have two of that something. So on the left side, I have two cosine squared theta d theta. And on the right side, I have um, cosine theta times sine theta plus one d theta. Let's go ahead and, um, and take care of this nonsense. So that is just going to be theta, right? If I take the antiderivative of 1, it's just going to be, you know, that variable that we are integrating with respect to. So this turns into this plus theta, right? This guy turns into theta. Let's see what else. Okay, and then on the left side, I have this. Now, originally, what was my original problem? Let's go way back up. Oops. Our original problem, let me do this in, was this. That is what I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find the integral of cosine squared theta d theta. And look, all I have to do to find that, the integral of cosine squared theta d theta, is to divide both sides by 2 to isolate that. Okay? So that's my answer. Cosine squared theta d theta, the integral of that is equal to cosine times sine plus theta all over 2. And this is my answer right here. All right, guys, I am going to um, pick up on the next example in the next part of this video. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next part. For this problem, I want to integrate e to the 2x times sine of 3x. Since I have a product of functions, I'm going to attempt to use the integration by parts rule boxed in red. So the first thing I want to do is I want to identify what is u and what is dv in that formula on the left side. So u, remember, is going to be the thing that when you take the derivative of it, it gets simpler than its original form. So if we look at e to the 2x and I take the derivative of it, I have to use the chain rule here. So the derivative of this is going to be the derivative of the outer function times the derivative of the inner function. On the other hand, um, for the other function, sine of 3x, Again, I have to use the chain rule, so derivative of the outer function, derivative of sine is cosine, so this is cosine of 3x times the derivative of the inner function, which is 3. So with respect to the original forms, it doesn't look like either of these gets less complicated, so I am going to choose one of these at random to call u. If it doesn't work out, then we can always go back and choose another u, but um, you know, we have to kind of pick one at random here because they neither one of these gets a whole lot simpler than its original form or any simpler. So what I'm going to do is I am going to choose u as sine of 3x. That means that du, if I take the derivative of both sides, is going to be 3 cosine of 3x using the chain rule. I'm just taking the derivative of sine of 3x. And then the rest of the product, so this was part of the product, the rest of the product that I left out is going to be my dv. And again, we're looking at just the left side of this formula right now. So dv is going to be e to the 2x dx. And we need to figure out what v is by taking the antiderivative of dv. So this is some scratch work, because we're trying to find v. v is going to be the integral of e to the 2x dx. Now here, since we just have, um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple integral, but we need to use u substitution to do it. So here, we're going to let u equal 2x. And again, this u is not the same as the u above. This is just scratch work du is going to be 2dx when I apply the derivative operator. And finally, if I divide both sides by 2, I get du is equal, or sorry, 
du over 2 is equal to dx. So now I can make my substitutions to make this problem easier. I have e to the u, and in instead of u, we have 2x. Instead of dx, we have du over 2. And then I'm going to pull out that 1 half. Now, since e to anything, e to the x, e to the u, is its own derivative, when I take the integral of e to the u, it's simply going to be e to the u. So this is my answer here. Finally, if I plug in what u originally was, which was 2x, I get a half e to the 2x. Okay? So let's put that up here. 1 half e to the 2x. Okay, great. So now that I have that, let's go ahead and I'm going to write the entire thing here. I have the left side of this integration by parts problem, and you'll see why I'm doing this. Dx equals, now the right side is going to be u times v, so we have, I'm going to do the v in front, just because it's going to look neater, 1 half e to the 2x times sine of 3x, so that's u times v, or v times u, same thing, minus the integral of v, a half e to the 2x, times du, which is 3 cosine of 3x, and I missed it up here, but I need to make sure to add that dx right there. Um, everything looks pretty good except this integral right here. So let's go ahead and kind of see how we can simplify this down. Now, you know, again, we have a product of functions, so we're going to have to use integration by parts a second time. But before we do that, let's clean it up a little bit and pull out the constants. So the constants I see here is a half and three, which makes three halves when multiplied. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to just write it line by line, e to the 2x sine of 3x dx is equal to a half e to the 2x sine of 3x, and then we're going to pull out that 3 halves in the front. Okay, and so then we have left over, we have e to the 2x times cosine of 3x dx. And so far, you know, why I brought the left side because I'm looking for some like terms that I can combine like the previous problem to kind of make this simpler, but I don't have any. I have a sine of 3x and I have a cosine of 3x, so that's going to kind of mess things up. I Ideally, those integrals will be the exact same so that I can add or subtract one to the other side and uh, and do my problem that way. So what I have to do here... Um, is I have to do integration by parts a second time, which is annoying, but here we go. And there may be an easier way to do this, um, but for now, just for practice, let's go ahead and do integration by parts a second time. So we need to do a u and a dv. And again, this was pretty similar to the problem we had before. Notice that, you know, we don't have a good u to choose because each of these, you know, the e to the 2x and the cosine of 3x, when you take the derivative of them, they get sort of equally as complicated with respect to how they were. So again, I'm going to choose the trig function as u just because I felt like it. No particular reason, but let's see what happens. Well, actually, maybe there is a reason. The reason is because I'm thinking that if I take the derivative of this and it becomes a sine, it's going to look closer to the left side, which is going to give me, possibly give me an opportunity to combine like terms. So that's my logic there. Okay, so if I take the derivative of both sides, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So du is negative sine. I never give myself enough room here. Let's write it up here du is equal to negative sine 
of 3x times 3 using the chain rule. dv is going to be what's left over. So what we started with was cosine of 3x. What's left over is e to the 2x dx. Now we just integrated this. So we know what v is here as well. Um, so v, remember when dv was e to the 2x, v came out to be 1 half e to the 2x. And I'm just lazy, so that's why I'm not doing this again, just because we already did the same problem up here. Okay, so let's go ahead and use all of this. I'm going to have to write pretty time. Mm, let's see if I can fit it all in here. e to the 2x sine of 3x dx is equal to, turn my mic here so you guys can hear me better. Um, all right, so 1 half e to the 2x sine of 3x minus, a ha minus 3 halves. And then I'm going to start my integration by parts in this bracket here, right? Because that's going to take care of this. I'll do it in red. So this is the, what I circled is the left side of integration by parts. The right side is going to be u times v. So we have um, 1 half e to the 2x times cosine of 3x minus. Then we have a half e to the 2x times du negative sine, and this should have a dx right there, times 3 dx. Okay, so that's what I have so far. Now I'm going to clean up the integral, which is all of this. I'm going to do that by pulling out a negative 3 halves, because those are the constants that I see that I can pull out, I see the negative 1, the 1 half, and the 3 are all being multiplied. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rewrite this as e to the 2x sine of 3x dx is equal to a half e to the 2x sine of 3x. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, minus 3 halves. And then I have 1 half e to the 2x cosine of 3x. Here we go. Okay, the, the two minuses, when I pull out this minus inside, is going to become a plus, okay? Plus 3 halves. All right, so that's outside of here. Then we have e to the 2x sine of 3x dx. And this is where we're going to use our trick, okay? Now, before I use the trick, I'm going to make sure that I distribute, because all of this in brackets is being multiplied by this negative 3 halves out in the front. So it's multiplying by that and this guy, okay? So let's go ahead and, uh, and do that. We're almost done. We're almost done here. So let's see, 1 half e to the 2x sine of 3x. When I multiply the negative 3 halves by the first term, I end up getting um, negative 3 fourths e to the 2x cosine of 3x. Then the negative 3 halves times the positive 3 halves is, bec is going to become a negative... Um, Let's see if I got that right. Yeah, that looks good. A negative 9 fourth. Negative 9 fourth. E to the 2x. Sine of 3x. Dx. Okay. So now I'm in a good position because on the left side of my equal sign, I have... This guy, and on the right side, I have a like term. I have negative 9 fourths e to the 2x sine of 3x. 
dx. So just like in the previous problem, I'm going to add 9 fourths of these guys, e to the 2x sine of 3x dx, to both sides. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and do that. Da, 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 plus 9 over 4 of these. Okay. All right, here we go. So the left side of this equation, if I have, I have 1 of something plus 9 fourths of something. So 4 fourths plus 9 fourths is uh, <laughs> 13 fourths. Okay, so on the left side I get, when I combine these like terms, I get 13 fourths of these things, e to the 2x sine of 3x dx, and on the right side I'm left with a half e to the 2x sine of 3x minus 3 fourths e to the 2x cosine of 3x. Okay. Um, my last step, because remember, my original problem was to find this, find the integral of e to the 2x sine of 3x, right? That was my original problem. So I'm going to isolate that at this point. I'm going to multiply both sides by 4 over 13 to cancel that out. So all of that by 4 over 13. And I'm going to leave it like this because I am lazy. And let me just uh, check my math here. It looks okay. Yeah, it looks to be, it looks good. See how I'm like, you know, very careful with checking this kind of stuff. Oh, but of course the plus C, we can't forget that. So this was a super long and involved problem, but it's super good practice um, for these integration by parts problems. So that is your final answer boxed in red right there. All right, let's do this one. This one is going to be slightly simpler than the last one. Um, we have a product of functions. This time our variable is t. We have t plus 3 times the square root of 7 plus 3t. So you know, what are our options? We want to choose a u. So we have t plus 3, and we have the square root of 7 plus 3t, which I'm going to write like this. Because remember, when we take derivatives, that's the easiest way to, to do it. So when I take the derivative of t plus 3, I just get 1. When I take the derivative of the square root of 7 plus 3t, I get, I have to use chain rule, 1 half. 7 plus 3t to the negative 1 half times the derivative of the inside function, which is just 3. Derivative of 7 plus 3t is 3. That got complicated. However, this one did not. This one got simpler. So that's what I'm going to choose my u to be. I'm going to choose u to be t plus 3, and I'm going to choose dv to be the rest. So I'm going to choose dv to be the rest because t plus 3 has a, has a very uncomplicated derivative. All right, so let's go ahead and, and start there. So we have u is equal to t plus 3. Therefore, du, when I take the derivative of both sides, is just 1 dt. OK? Now, dv was the leftovers. So dv is equal to 7 plus 3t to the 1 half. And now we are tasked with finding v, OK? So let's go ahead and do that off to the side. So we need our scratch work here. So this is our scratch work. OK, so what are we trying to find? We are trying to integrate uh, 7 plus 3t to the 1 half dt. I forgot the dt. That's another thing I forget besides the c is the dx, the dt, and so forth. So here we don't have a product of functions, so chances are we don't need to use integration of parts. We can get away with an easier method known as substitution. So substitution, I want to make u equal something so that I can evaluate the integral. And here what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to let u equal 7 plus 3t. Therefore, du is just equal to 3dt. And if I isolate dt, I get that dt is du over 3. So let's go ahead and make these substitutions here. I have u to the 1 half, and instead of dt, I have du over 3. I'm going to pull out the 1 third. And now I'm going to find the integral of u to the 1 half. So remember what I do with these simple polynomial functions is I just add 1 to the exponent and divide by whatever that gives me. So when I add 1 to 1 half, I get 3 halves. And when I divide by 3 halves, that's the same thing as multiplying by 2 thirds. Okay, so that is my answer here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and sub, oops, sub back in the u, which was 7 plus 3t. So I have a third, 2 thirds times 7 plus 3t to the 3 halves. And altogether, this is going to give me 2 ninths, 7 plus 3t to the 3 halves. Let's go ahead and write that up here. So this is equal to, this is equal to v. Okay, so let's put that there. So we have v is 2 ninths, 7 plus 3t to the 1 half. Or did I do... That looks good. Okay. All right, good. So let's go ahead and continue with this. Did I put one half there? It should be three halves. Three halves. Okay, so that was my scratch work. Let's go ahead and keep going with this one. Okay. All right, so this was the left side. Now I'm going to use the right side. So this is equal to u, t plus 3, times v, which is 2 ninths, times 7 plus 3t to the 3 halves. Okay. Minus the integral of v, 2 ninths, 7 plus 3t to the 3 halves times du, which is dt. All right, let's go ahead and take care of this piece. This is always the pain to deal with. Let's go ahead and just do it in orange. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out the 2 ninths. This is minus 2 ninths, 7 plus 3 t to the 3 halves dt. And then I have everything else. Okay. All right, so now I have to I have to take the antiderivative of this guy. Well, how am I going to do it? Well, I'm going to use u substitution again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let u equal 7 plus 3t. Therefore, du is equal to 3dt. And finally, dt is equal to du over 3. All right. So let's go ahead and, you know, I'm going to do this in red. We're looking at this part. Okay, so I have u to the 3 halves times du over 3. Pulling out the 1 third, I get this. And finally, integrating with respect to u, 
I'm adding one to three halves. So three halves plus two over two is five halves. Divide by five is the same thing as multiplying by two fifths. And I have to multiply by that a third, one third in front. So I end up getting 2 15th u and was 7 plus 3t. So 7 plus 3t to the 5 halves. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and replace that. I'm just going to start here. plus 3t to the 3 halves, minus 2 ninths, and then I'm going to replace what I have found out. 2 fifteenths, 7 plus 3t. 2 fifteenths times 7 plus 3t to the 5 halves. And I am not going to simplify any further, but um, this is going to be our answer. So this is the right side of our integration by parts problem. Let's do one more. Find the area between y equals ln of x and y equals ln of x squared for x is between 2 and 6. So let's go ahead and look at this on a graph first. So we have ln of x and ln of x squared. Okay, and maybe we'll do, we'll actually just do the domain restriction here too. We are going from x equals 2 to x equals 6. So let's see. All right, so I have that piece, and then same thing down here. All right, so I am trying to find the area between these two curves, right? So, um, you know, just this this area between the blue curve and the red curve, that white space in between there. So what am I trying to do? Well, if I integrate the blue curve, that's going to give me all of the area from the blue curve all the way down to the x-axis. And same idea with the red curve. So what I want to do is take the area under the blue curve minus the area under the red curve to just give me what I am interested in, which is the area between those two curves. All right, so what I want to do is I am trying to find the area under ln x squared. Then I'm going to take away the area under ln of x. All right, so let's go ahead and first figure out what the area under ln of x squared is. So I'm going from 2 to 6, ln of x squared, dx. And I'm going to go ahead and try to use substitution here. So if I let u equal x squared, then du is equal to 2x, right? And so that's 2x dx. And when I solve for dx, I get dx is equal to du over 2x, which is not going to help us because, right, our, our problem becomes this when I make the substitutions.
and I still have this 2x. This is the problem here. Now, if I didn't have that, I could definitely, you know, use the substitution as it is, but, but um, I don't. So I have to use integration by parts. So let's write it over here. We have u dv is equal to uv minus v du. I need to choose a u and I need to choose a dv here. Now we don't have a lot of options for u, so since we only have this one function, I'm gonna let u equal that function. So I'm gonna say u is equal to x squared, and therefore du is equal to, well, remember this, this is the chain rule. So the derivative of ln of x is one over x, therefore the derivative of ln of x squared is one over x squared times the derivative of the inner function. The derivative of x squared is just two x dx. Simplifying this out, I get that du is equal to uh, two over x dx. So let's actually Write that over here. So the remaining portion is going to be dv, and the remaining portion is just dx because u was ln of x squared. So dv is going to be equal to dx, and so v, if I, you know, this is just one dx, if I Take the integral of that, that's just going to give us x. And now we can apply integration by parts here. So I have u times v. So we have x times ln of x squared minus v times du. Simplifying this out, and finally, if I integrate, um, you know, this, if I pull out the two first, actually, and I get this, well, this is just going to become 2x. Okay, so remember, since this is, this is a definite integral, right? I have these upper and lower bounds. I need to evaluate this thing from two to six. So what I get is six ln six squared minus two times six. Okay, so that was the top, minus plugging in the bottom for x, two, ln of 2 squared minus 2 times 2. Okay, so that is ln of, that's the integral of ln of x squared. So let's go ahead and simplify this out a little bit. Let's see what we get when we simplify. Um, we get 6 ln of 36 minus two ln of four, minus eight. So this is the area of ln x squared. All right, so let's just put that in our pocket. All right, so remember we have to next find area of ln of x. And I believe we did this in a previous problem, but let's just go ahead and do it anyway. Um, or maybe we won't. Let's see. Let me see what slide this was so I can just copy this information down here. What slide did we do this on? This was number seven. Okay, this was slide number seven. We had that the integral of ln of x ended up being 
x ln x um, minus x. Yeah, let's see. x ln x minus x. Okay, good. And then we're evaluating again, since this is definite from 2 to 6. So this is going to give me 6 ln 6 minus 6 minus 2 ln 2 minus 2. All right. So let's box these two things that we need. We need this and we need this. And remember, we want to find the area between the curves, so we need to do the area of ln x squared, which is what we found up top, top box, minus the area of ln of, of ln of x, 6 ln 6 minus 6 minus 2 ln 2 minus 2. So this is our answer here. We can definitely simplify it or write it in decimal form, but um, I'm not going to do that here. But you can just put this in decimos and get a decimal answer if, if you know, one of the homework problems requires you to do that. All right, that is the end of this lecture on integration by parts. I uh, hope you learned a lot, and I will see you guys next week. Thanks for watching.